the planing tool goes back to really, really early times. If you're talking about before Christ, Roman times, many of these planes, wood planes, were um, handmade. Uh, they required to be handmade, as you couldn't purchase them. And if a particular job required doing, then the carpenter joiner would manufacture it. They're all manufactured from beech. And beech is a very stable timber and uh, much sought after now and in decorative furniture uh, and so on. The handles of many of the tools are made with beech. The planes themselves that we have here are entirely made of beech. The plane would be assembled and soaked in linseed oil. Now that stabilizes the timber. It, uh, it's a living, breathing organism. And as you look after it, it will take care of itself. Uh, the weight uh, in these, you can almost tell by holding them, the, uh, and you can't see this on a video, uh, just how much linseed oil must have been put into them because of their weight. A piece of uh, dried out beech would weigh about the same as this one here, but this side you can actually feel the density of the timber as it's been soaked in linseed oil. That was to preserve the wood. And uh, many of them have a, a manufacturer's name printed on them. And uh, this is a jack plane and uh, a jack of all trades. That's where it comes from, uh, master of none. So this does the same job as one of these or one of these. And there is a, a, a longer one that you can get and uh, a half long, so half as long again, and that was to uh, plane uh, long lengths of the timber as would have been uh, used, let's say, tables. As they wear out, they have to be re-planed, smoothed off and made true, and consequently the gap here where the blade shows through, gets wider and wider. Uh, the narrower the gap between the blade and the, the sole of the plane, then it, the finer the shaving you can uh, get. This one's had a patch put in it, and that is to make up for the wear and tear on the sole of the plane. Eventually, it gets too thin and it's no use. It would be discarded or turned into a smaller version, depending on how the uh, owner uh, use it. This one <coughs> has an insert here of another piece of hardwood. In this case, it's ironwood or lignoviti. And uh, to release the blade, quick tap there. Takes the wedge out and the blade itself. The blade itself has two parts, a cover iron and the, the bit that does the work. Now, I had a screwdriver looking for me, here it is. Only most of these blades are in two parts. This is the sharp end, if you like, when it's honed up on a stone and cleaned. It's stropped and uh, we have a very, very fine edge that you could actually shave with. Done it, so I know what I'm speaking about. This iron here, as you may or may not see, has a slight round on it. Now, as that makes contact with the flat of the blade here, when it's in position within the, the, the plane, as it's cutting through the, the, the wood, shaving comes off, hits this round, starts to curl. That's what breaks up. You, 
you could end up with a straight shaving, but again, it's got to be very, very finely set. They take an inordinate time to set up so in some cases, but then the days that these were being used, nobody was in a hurry. The European style of planing is to pull the plane towards you. Here in the UK, we tend to push them away. Why? I don't know, because it's much easier to plane the wood uh, towards you. You can more control, especially with these. The other uh, planes we have here are these narrow ones. Now, they come in various sizes and shapes on the soles. This is for an internal groove. This would be for an external round on a piece of uh, wood. If one had to fit into the other, we may use a larger one. As you can see, the rounds go inside. Not these two particularly, but you would get a moulding plane that would suit. And look, there's a wider one with a wider sole. Excuse me. So these two would be a matching pair. One for the internal cut and one for the external. And there you are. And they almost match the soles. Again, these are planes you would have to manufacture yourself. You couldn't buy them. Here's one that's been, uh, had an additional piece put on made of metal. Now it's going to be longer lasting. This moulding plane here, again, it's quite elaborate and uh, adjustable on the sole. Affectionately known as these tools, all these small wooden ones there, would be known as gillums. Where that name came from, I don't know. But you can see how this moves out and in, and you could set it to do a check on a piece of wood. That would set the width, and the depth would be controlled by this depth gauge here. The blades, there's two blades on this one. One for the uh, surface of the wood, and one on the edge, which does the same job as a marking gauge. It cuts the line of the, the channel you wish to manufacture. The depth stop, which is this bit, is set up or down accordingly to arrange the uh, how far down you want to make the cut. It's not hand adjusted, it's screw adjusted. This one here, so you've got a finer control over the depth stop here. And here we have the boring tools or braces that were used to, uh, we don't have the bits unfortunately, but various uh, auger bits would be slotted into these. Adjustable neck on it, which allows for a ratchet. This inner part has a is spring loaded. Doesn't matter if I hit it. Quite robust. For a long time, they were manufactured in America. And British uh, carpenters joiners took over the the imports. Uh, simply because America had more peace in their land and because of wartime, uh, many of these tools were non-existing at this side of the Atlantic. And so there was a, a, a quite an influx of American-based uh, tools, and more especially after the two great wars. This uh, brace here, as with the other ones we have, has a ratchet. You can hear the click. 
So you, you couldn't forget it into a confined space. Uh, this one's uh, the handle for pressing. You use vertically or horizontally, and it gets the, the name of being the belly brace because you hold it against your stomach and push in. And you've got two hands, you can put more pressure on the, the brace itself. Here we have another brace, more modern, and it's called, it's a wheel brace, as you can, as it's self-explanatory. This one's rather stiff, been oiled. Uh, now, <clears throat> the expensive one and the cheapy one. The cheaper one doesn't have a counterbalance wheel on it. Makes it more difficult to use. Whereas this one, made by a famous uh, company called Stanley, uh, a, an American company, but this was made by Stanley in England. It's got the name stamped there. When you had the American style, the uh, one that would have USA printed on it. The marking tools. You have a number of them here, and uh, as you can see, you take various angles and reproduce them as, as you was, or there may be a, a cut, a particular cut you require. You would set this, mark it, lay that aside, and then the next piece of wood, that would never move. And there you have your uh, repeat of the piece you were wanting to mark out. We have marking gauges. Uh, traditional joint, this would be used on, could be a mortise and tenon joint, where one piece of wood fits into the other. And these are, have cut, this is a cutting gauge in particular. Uh, this one here has a spur. I'll just move it a wee bit, maybe see it better. Through there has a, a spike. The other one, I can just this one has a blade in it for slicing. This one would be made would be used to mark across the grain or cut through the grain, and the other marking along the grain where you just require the groove. But if you use this one across the grain, it would break the fibres of the wood and you wouldn't get a nice, even, uh, evenly marked joint. And that's the only difference between them. This one's been a rather expensive one in its time as it has various pieces of metal added to it to prevent wear. As I mentioned with the planes, these wear down as well. In this case, they've uh, faced it with brass and more especially the working area with brass. There's a screw on the end which allows you to remove the uh, cutter and dress it up on a a stone. Again, to hold the blade in place, we have a little wedge, brass wedge. So this slicing tool here, and that could be manufactured from an old saw blade. You never go and buy them again. You just take another blade and cut a piece of the blade. And they're very, very hard and uh, long lasting. This one's been blued. Now that's a term used when you harden a piece of metal and if you think about your school days, your technical teacher would take in the metalwork room and he could heat it up under the, 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 the furnace and you'd see the metal change in colour and when it reaches a certain colour it can be dipped. Well, we come to the mainstay of a carpenter or a joiner's skills and that is cutting a wood using a saw. We have two saws on display here. We have a panel saw and we have a crosscut saw. 
and the difference between the two is in the teeth. This is the cross-cut saw, mainly used to cut across the grain of the wood. This one is a panel saw and used for cutting thin panels such as in plywood or anything thinner and the, the teeth are much smaller. They can cut across the grain but they can also cut small lengths of timber with the grain. You wouldn't use a larger one because it would tear the fibres of the wood up and uh, make a mess of the joint effectively. <laughs> we don't have what is known as a rip saw here. That would be the saw that would rip the, the, the timber uh, buttons, if you like. Uh, these two would be the finishing saws. The, the, the uh, rip saw would be used, let's say, out in the forest.